Well, hello everyone. We now have arrived at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century. And that was a period of tremendous creativity in Russia, as everywhere else. And the period of uh, finding new ideas, new intriguing ways for art to explore. Also, what happened in Russia in particular, as we have seen through the course, well, originally Russian art was entirely dedicated to uh, religious purposes. And then uh, into the 19th century, the early 19th century, it was dedicated to social purposes. Whereas with all the reforms that happened in Russia at the, um, towards the end of the 19th century, almost uh, the artist almost felt that, well, the government is now taking care of the social problems and perhaps we can indulge a little, we can relax, we can look elsewhere. And uh, this was simultaneous with the aesthetic movement in England, with Belle Epoque in France, everything about beauty. And um, that's what Russian art saw now as well. They saw, they saw beauty. And one of the great explorers in, um, in this uh, venue, and the man who kind of built a bridge between uh, 19th century art and 20th century art in Russia, was uh, Mikhail Rubil, right here. Um, really an extraordinary man, uh, an extremely well-educated man. He had a degree in law before uh, enrolling in the Academy of Arts in uh, St. Petersburg. And um, he developed really an extraordinary way of painting. He constructed his forms by means of uh, sort of intersecting planes, uh, the, uh, creating these very fragile, almost uh, crystalline forms and I uh, just couldn't imagine building form in any other way. He also um, looked at himself somewhat um, as he thought the Renaissance artists conceived of themselves. Free men, full of ideas, full of brilliant education, full of freedom to do as they liked, as, uh, as they explored uh, new venues. He also was an eccentric, um, who felt that, well, as a great artist, and he had no doubt that he was a great artist, um, that he had freedom of behavior that did not necessarily have to, um, to fit into common rules. His education at uh, St. Petersburg um, Academy was not finished, actually, because a professor arrived from Kiev looking for a student, for a gifted artist, who would come with him back to Kiev uh, in order to restore ancient icons, uh, particularly in uh, the church of uh, St. Cyril. And he chose Vrubil, and so Vrubil went with him to Kiev. Now, Vrubil uh, was not really trained in Byzantine painting at this point, and as we remember, uh, all that painting in early Kiev in the 11th century was done by Byzantine artists. So Vrubil, in fact, will go to Venice, where Byzantine art was uh, still very much in evidence to study the techniques and to study the aura of it, the feeling of it. Um, so he spent some time there, then he returned to Kiev. And if you remember from our early lectures, here is the uh, High Sophia of Kiev, where Rubin also worked. He didn't just work on St. Kirill or St. Cyril, but also St. Vladimir and, and also the High Sophia. And here, originally, the Pantocrator was surrounded by four mosaic angels, but three of them uh, well, were destroyed, and uh, Vrubil, he did not restore the mosaics, but he painted the three of them in oil. So the only one, the original one, is this one in blue. He really preferred, and did, in fact, uh, apply his skill only to the subjects that appealed to him aesthetically. And in his art, the fantastic and the real will always um, act shoulder to shoulder. It's impossible to imagine Rubin's art without it, which is why Art Nouveau ultimately will appeal to him so much, because Art Nouveau in itself is the combination of real and, uh, and fantastic, of uh, sort of symbolic and uh, naturalistic forms. It's really critical to understanding uh, Vrubil, the, um, this whole naturalism and symbolism as acting um, shoulder to shoulder. 
Um, ultimately, he will leave Kiev because he just wished to go into different directions, uh, into aesthetic di directions that uh, were close to him, and the regimentality of uh, Byzantine art ultimately did not attract him. But that was the beginning of his career, and his uh, future career will always be uh, colored by that experience. Tragically, um, in the beginning of the um, 20th century, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, mental illness and he did exhibit manic behavior. He just would imagine himself as one of historical figures and would be convinced that that, that was he. So the last decade of his life um, was spent pretty much in, um, in, in an institution. Uh, not dissimilar to Van Gogh, and uh, his genius was also not dissimilar from Van Gogh, even though the production, the artistic production, of course, was very different. Well, here are some of his sketches for various uh, religious subjects, and in this case, this is the yes, this is his resurrection uh, triptych, and um, already here one can see this. Um, the, his fragile crystalline forms, these are done either in tempera or watercolors, and there are different uh, variants of this. And uh, uh, the, um, the outer worldliness of these images, uh, a very different outer worldliness from uh, the Byzantine uh, imagery, which was actually very, very concrete. This one is not, this is ephemeral. Uh, and uh, here is one of his lamentations, uh, whereby well, one, when one thinks about lamentation, one often thinks of Michelangelo's Pieta that was done at the end of the 15th century and lives in the Vatican. Well, this is a very different uh, image. Again, Michelangelo's Pieta obeys the rules of the Renaissance. It also is uh, a Neoplatonic image that has to do with perfect forms and even the mother not so much grieving for her son as exhibiting the son's sacrifice to humanity. Uh, here is the mother that is grieving. Uh, if we didn't have uh, halos around their heads, we would not know that this is a Christian image. This is a very, very touching human image of a grieving mother. And these are various other sketches of the same. Here is another lamentation here, when even the color itself has uh, a mystical quality to it. And angel with the censer and candle sort of appears as the angel of the Annunciation. Well, this is then the beginning of Christ's life, because it is with the archangel's words that uh, touched uh, Mary's ear that um, incarnation happened. He married uh, a very famous singer and her name is um, Nadezhda Zabela. Uh, the story goes that uh, Vrubi, who loved opera, came to see uh, one of the operas in, in which uh, Zabela was singing and was so struck with uh, her beauty and was so struck with her voice that he ran to her dressing room after the performance and just started kissing her hands and she was completely struck by it. She had no idea who that was, but then ultimately um, he introduced himself as so-and-so, and then by that time she had heard the name. He proposed within a week or so after their first meeting, and surprisingly she said yes. And, and then he would paint her in uh, very many ways as, uh, uh, as an actress, as personification of uh, so many figures in the opera. And uh, this is where Zadella uh, played that sung uh, the Swan Princess. One of his um, constant themes uh, was the theme of a demon, but along with this theme he also embraced uh, the, uh, the figure of God, Pan, right here. And he was the god of Arcadia, and the actual Arcadia in Greece is very mountainous, is very wild, uh, nothing of the pastoral ideal that uh, that later artists made, made it out to be. And Pan was the god of Arcadia, he was the god of shepherds, uh, he was the god of the wild flocks, uh, mountain, uh, mountainous areas, uh, rustic music, various impromptus, uh, father of Silenos, very much connected to the Benads, very much connected to the uh, 
uh, nymphs. And uh, he does, he has the legs and horns of a goat in the same manner as a fawn or satyr. Um, he also is recognized as the god of fields and groves and uh, the god of uh, agriculture and the god of procreation. So there are always sexual overtones as well. And as a result, he was always worshipped in caves uh, and in forests. Uh, there are very few temples to God. Pan. According to Plutarch, who lived in the first century AD, uh, Pan is actually the only god who, in fact, dies. And that idea became extremely popular later on. In fact, uh, even the early Christian fathers interpreted it as that with Pan, all pantheistic religions died as well. And that was a play on words, essentially, because in Greek, Pan also means all, everything. And uh, so with this story, uh, it seems to the early Christian fathers that, well, with the pantheistic religions dying, the vacuum that was created by the ancient world as the ancient world disappeared, the vacuum was filled in with uh, Christianity. But there are all sorts of stories that are connected um, to Pan. Arcadia was inhabited by a whole different tribe of people, and um, which were different from the uh, from the classical Greeks. And uh, and they were hunters. They were wild hunters, and uh, Pan was their god. But uh, when hunting was unsuccessful, they would scourge the uh, images of Pan, and uh, the way. Vrubil is portraying him. It's, uh, it's really kind of fascinating because he's very old. That's how he portrays him. Even though the eyes are spectacular, they are these incredibly bright young eyes that will live forever, even if the body will um, fall off. Again, sort of platonic idea of beauty still living on and of uh, human spirit and human will still living on. And Pan, perhaps, was one of the most human of gods, even though the majority of Greek gods were quite human, but Pan perhaps was one of the most human of them. And, um, and here he is, uh, his uh, fingers, he paints his fingers parallel with, he, with the reed pipes that Pan plays. And often the same god, uh, Pan, was also confused with Marcius, who is in the same category of gods, who challenged Apollo to a music contest and then as a result was flayed alive. Well, this god has certainly survived uh, a lot of uh, persecution, shall we say, and had become extremely wise in the process. He is uh, on the brink of death, perhaps, and that's how Vrubil is painting him, this incredibly wise man who had lived through so much uh, unhappiness and yet knew most extraordinary happiness uh, and most extraordinary feats of, uh, of glory and procreation uh, and sexual ecstasy. All of it is in this. And again, he, and, and the moon, as you see, is setting uh, on his life. I mean, the whole idea of, um, of uh, the pen is dead, uh, sort of spilled out into Nietzsche's God is dead, with all these incredible parallels, and it became very, very popular in uh, 19th century, 18th century. Uh, the, and many writers wrote on that subject, and here, in fact, the, the Vrubil's um, uh, technique of painting in these crystalline planes uh, corresponds with his with the, with, with the content of his painting. He painted many images of demons and here is one of them and this one is called uh, uh, the seated demon and well became a common theme in his works. He uh, be began to paint demons at uh, a very early stage and then demons uh, followed him throughout his entire life. Um, this particular demon is an illustration actually to a brilliant poem by a Russian poet, Lermontov, who, who is valued on the same level as Pushkin. And he too died in a duel, except while Pushkin died at the age of 37, which is still ridiculously young, Lermontov died at 27, a decade 
earlier. And, uh, but by that time, already produced an extraordinary body of work. And, um, and Demon is one of the most romantic uh, stories as outcasts from heaven. The fallen angels actually established their own kingdom and with the capital that's called Pandemonium, and which refers to either all in Greek or our god Pan. It's a place where the fallen angels live and they even they built uh, palaces, play music, debate freely have the freedom. Sort of like um, the ancient Greek titans uh, who were ultimately expelled from the Mount Olympus. In Lermontov's poem, however, he places his demon in the Caucasus Mountains where Lermontov traveled much and wrote great poetry about them. It's very, very romantic and he cannot uh, find his own uh, soul. He cannot find his happiness. He is uh, very unsettled. And then he beholds uh, a beautiful uh, princess by the name of Tamara and Tamara is dancing just before her wedding day because she is about to be married to a wonderful prince and uh, Lermontov's demon falls immediately in love with her and um, he destroys, he destroys the prince and then causes for Tamara to fall in love with him which Tamara does, but then there is Vrubil actually painted another painting of the last kiss because just by kissing the demon Tamara will die. This one was painted in 1890, so it was a decade before he was actually diagnosed with his illness, but uh, he was always noticed by his friends as very irritable and, uh, and fanciful, so it's possible that uh, the illness uh, was already beginning to to take its toll. You remember this painting by Kramskoy that was uh, painted about 20 years before Vrubil uh, painted uh, his demon. But there's a parallel there, just as um, there's Christ uh, who is uh, searching for the right way because he is now tempted by a demon in the wilderness. And as Christ will find the right way, presumably, then uh, it's almost as if it's Vrubil's answer to Kramskoy's painting of Christ because his demon will find an answer that suits him. A decade later, uh, just about the year when he was diagnosed with his illness, he will paint a number of uh, downcast demons. And, uh, and he chooses this, this, this interesting shape to represent the cast demon, very narrow, very long, as, as if pressing the demon down. Alexandre Benoit, of whom we'll talk soon, uh, when he saw this painting, he wrote, one can believe the prince of the world posed for him. There's something deeply true in these terrible and wonderful paintings, agitating to tears. His demon was faithful to his nature. He who came to love Vrubil still deceived him. Those seances were entirely scorn and mockery. Vrubil saw now one and now another side of his deity, now both of them, and in the pursuit after that subtlety, he started quickly moving toward the abyss which his passion for the occult pushed him into. And, uh, well, that's what Benoit noticed as well, is that there's this relationship between Vrubil and the demon, and uh, the demonic passions possess Vrubil as well. And yes, the passion for the occult was uh, all the rage, not only in St. Petersburg, but also in Berlin, uh, in Europe in general. And, uh, well, Vrubil brought uh, the art, Russian art certainly, from the 19th into the 20th century. He really was the bridge. And uh, with his passions, he also brought to the surface the existential nature of art, which uh, the uh, writers and artists and poets will then pick up. And that is not just the making of art, but uh, living in art and living through art. And, uh, well, tons and tons and tons of material will be written on that subject. And, well, in Russia, at least, Vrubil is responsible for it. He really was. A revolutionary. He was a demon in his own right, really an extraordinary painter. And now we go to another painter, uh, a contemporary painter, 
whose name uh, was Valentin Serov. He did embrace Impressionism, uh, not on Impressionist terms, but on his own terms. Ultimately, Serov really was a Russian John Singer Sargent. That's what he was. He was <laughs> a brilliant portraitist, uh, and uh, people felt that uh, his paintings were this effortless product of a spontaneous gift. The same thing as with Sargent. That wasn't quite the case. He did very much work on his canvases and thought about his canvases, but the result came out very spontaneous and absolutely brilliant. And he too, just as with Vrubil, he only uh, painted what appealed to him aesthetically. This was the age, as I said, the aesthetic movement in England, the Belle Epoque in, uh, in France. And uh, we will talk about Mir Iskustva, the world of art, uh, a group uh, of thinkers and artists that uh, that appeared at the end of the 19th century in St. Petersburg, and that's what uh, they embraced. They embraced beauty in all its forms, um, and uh, Serov uh, will do too. Uh, in this case, here he is, and he is painting uh, this brilliant portrait of Felix Yusupov. He, in fact, he is actually going to be one of the uh, uh, one of the men who will put down Rasputin, uh, who had such a great influence on the Tsaritsa. Well, he was a society painter. He painted all the greatest uh, aristocratic figures, including the Tsar, uh, but he also painted those he loved, uh, and whether, whether writers or musicians or painters. And this is a brilliant portrait of uh, Nicholas II. He's actually in Scotland, and he is um, wearing a full dress uniform of the Royal Scots Greys and the regiment to which he was appointed as uh, Colonel-in-Chief by, uh, by Victoria, his uh, grandmother, in um, 1894. And uh, he wore this uniform uh, at several events during his uh, visits to Scotland uh, with his wife. And while they were in Scotland, a contingent of the Scots Grace always acted as the Imperial Escort. And here, that's how Serov is painting him, and uh, well, it's a brilliant likeness, as I said. A Russian sergeant. He also painted him, well, at home, so to speak. And in this case, he is wearing the jacket of uh, the Preobrazhensky uh, Imperial Regiment, which was the elite Imperial Regiment, and he loved that uniform. He always wore it, actually. That was his usual attire, the Nicholas II. Um, while Serov was painting Nicholas, Alexandra was there and the seemingly uh, not liking what Serov was doing, the, the portrait uh, would interrupt him at all times and say, no, please do this here and please do that there, to the point where Serov ultimately just said, well, Your Majesty, would you, would you like to paint it yourself? Which was incredibly cheeky, of course, but presumably shut her down. Um, so it's an informal portrait. This is uh, still another of Serov's portraits, and that is of the Princess Olga Arlova that he did in, uh, in 1911. And as I said, if I didn't know who that was, I would just immediately thank Sargent. Uh, as I said here, Valentin Serov equals John Singer Sargent. Well, she's a princess, and doesn't she look it? He also did some of the historical paintings, because uh, historical paintings were still very much in fashion. And he is a delightful one. Uh, he uh, portrays Empress Elizabeth Petrovna, Elizabeth Petrovna, who was uh, a daughter of uh, Peter the Great, with her nephew, Peter II. Um, but uh, she will cause that nephew to be put to death so that she could become an uh, empress. She very characteristically wears men's clothes and that's what she liked to do. She just loved going hunting and wearing men's clothes and that's what Serov is painting. The, uh, he certainly uses impressionistic techniques in this but also that uh, same spontaneity and, uh, and swiftness uh, that is characteristic of his uh, portraits as well. And here they are, here she is, and as they uh, um, gallop through the countryside, it doesn't matter who is in their way, and uh, if they, if they uh, wound someone or kill someone, so be it. I mean, this is Russia and life is cheap. They're having a great time. Um, as all Russians, he was fascinated with the idea of Peter the Great, and we saw this painting when we discussed Peter the Great, and this is done by Serov. 
and uh, well, Pushkin, uh, who died in uh, 1837, he wrote uh, a poem uh, called The Bronze Rider, uh, and that is about the equestrian statue of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg, which is, uh, which is a symbol of St. Petersburg, one of. And in the beginning of that poem, uh, Peter is standing uh, on the bank of the uh, New River and contemplating the building of the new city, which would be the window into the West, the window into the Baltic Sea and then into, into the West in general. And uh, as he strides also around and nothing is there, and he dreams of the, uh, the future sails that would uh, uh, make their way from his dream city to the West. And Sirov, uh, in a way, paints that here as well. So that's the one that we looked at. He went to Paris several times, and um, on one of his uh, trips to Paris, he was commissioned to paint um, a portrait of Ida Rubinstein. Well, she was an extraordinary woman. She was Russian, Russian-Jewish, born in Kharkov, even though she always uh, hid that fact, um, because one had to be born either in Moscow or better yet in St. Petersburg. But um, she was born in Kharkov in an extremely wealthy family. Her family was very wealthy. They were merchants in sugar. Then they became bankers. Uh, and her father came to St. Petersburg. And then she, she was given a brilliant education. She was sent to her aunts in St. Petersburg. She was taught all European languages, history, the arts. She was not classically beautiful, as was considered uh, beautiful in Russia. She was not a natural dancer either, but she was determined that she was going to be beautiful and she was going to be a dancer. And with that in mind, with that purpose in mind, this girl went off to Paris and in Paris she began to take dancing lessons and uh, develop her extremely eccentric personality. Eccentric in her dress, eccentric in her behavior, eccentric in absolutely everything she did. Paris was at a uh, her feet. Uh, it's amazing because at the same time Anna Pavlova, who was a great ballerina, was, uh, while well, she was very much appreciated of course, but uh, Ida Rubinstein had such an incredible personality. She was so much larger than life that her personality dimmed the personality of uh, Anna Pavlova. And she became a ballerina. She, was, she became a ballerina in the Ballet Russe that we'll be talking about presently. And um, the best designers designed costumes uh, for her. And now Sirov was commissioned to do her portrait. Uh, and uh, since everybody was at her feet, she really was uh, a femme fatale of, uh, of the hour. She was, uh, men just couldn't help falling in love with her. And Sirov is said to actually have purchased a hair shirt for himself, so that the hair shirt would remind him, would calm down his uh, male proclivities. Uh, and he paints this completely extraordinary painting that was actually laughed at um, by a number of artists. That's completely not Serov. That's not what Serov uh, was known for. He was known for this, for a princess, Olga Arlova. That was Serov. This was not but clearly the modern tendencies had an effect on him and as you can imagine the future art critics will explain this painting left right and center the fact is that he painted it in a very extremely short period of time and perhaps the woman's sexuality and, and the uh, the shirt that he wore had something to do with it he just wanted to be done with it as quickly as possible um, the interesting part also about the painting is that she chose an interesting venue. She chose a public space. It was um, an abandoned monastery in Paris that the painters used very often. Uh, it was bare of uh, all decoration and uh, her posing could be viewed by the public in general. And it was, as you can imagine, when Sirov was painting her, the Parisian, whoever knew about these sessions, came to watch. And didn't she love it? She was a poser from the word go. She was kind of a young Dali. Dali will probably match, match her pose for pose uh, in the future. But uh, right now, here's Ida. And uh, he gives her this unnaturally pale palette. 
uh, instead of his usual liveliness of uh, uh, color and decreased geometry of the shoulder blades. And her extravagance of manner is very much portrayed. She, uh, she has this ephemeral beauty that he also wanted to, to bring forth. Uh, oh, here, yes. And during his work, he donned a specially purchased rough canvas blouse to pacify the flesh, as he said. Um, now, Repin, the picture that he looked at last time, called the subject of Serov's portrait a galvanized corpse, and uh, Surikov called it a disgrace. Well, uh, when I look at this painting, it's quite clear that uh, Serov uh, was looking at Angers, uh, the Grand Adalis, and she does live in the Louvre, and uh, it also it has to do with... Um, Near Eastern subjects, and indeed, the uh, Ida Rubinstein was uh, was known for dancing Near Eastern roles and loved it very much. And at the time of Anger, the the world was enamored with the Near East. And uh, here is Sirov painting his Ida, and the pose is just too similar for Sirov not to have been influenced by by Anger. The extreme fragility of Ida, of course, here is very much conveyed, and that will become the model, that will become popular in ballet. We'll be talking about the ballet who's presently, because until then, ballerinas were full-bodied. It's really the, the ballet who's that revolutionized the, uh, the whole ballet technique. And then the graduates of the ballet who's, uh, George Blanchin and Alexander Danilova, will come to New York and establish the New York School of Dancers, and this all goes back to the ballet Rus. Um, and Ida Rubinstein was one of them. Sirov also painted several versions, actually, of uh, this abduction of uh, Europa, and he's kind of applying his newfound technique uh, of uh, marrying modernity to antiquity, and he was uh, very interested in Greece and in the antiquity, uh, the, the whole Russian Miroskustva, the world of art, will very much be interested in antiquity. And the same correspondence without uh, reality, uh, reality and the fantastical as we saw in Vrubil will also be true um, about Sirov to a certain extent. And um, so his Europa uh, sort of could very easily be both uh, an ancient Phoenician maiden as well as a modern model, and uh, the two of them very much correspond. Uh, so as he portrays this image, he kind of peels away so many layers of classicism, yet uh, conveying the immensity of the subject. Uh, and the subject is Zeus turned himself into a beautiful bull, and he abducted Europa, who was a Phoenician maiden, and then swam with her across the Mediterranean, as we see here, between these tremendous uh, waves to the island of Crete, where the two of them proceeded to sire the nation of Europe. So the subject is tremendous, and its hugeness is conveyed in very, in this case, in very economic lines, and uh, quite lovely, beautiful. Even though it's, he just seems towards... Uh, into the 20th century completely to have changed his style. And now we come to this group that was organized in St. Petersburg at the end of the 19th century. And it is called Mir Iskustva, or World of Art. And uh, uh, the painting was created uh, 1916-1920, but the group itself existed for about 20 years. These men were, the majority of them came from extremely cultured backgrounds, uh, wealthy backgrounds. They were concerned uh, with literature, art, especially illustration, actually book illustration, music, theater, designs, uh, also directing. They cultivated a gifted amateurism. To them, to be a gifted amateur was not a derogatory term at all, because they took a literal interpretation of this word. Uh, to be an amateur is to do something for amo, for amore, for, for love, uh, not to be a professional, because a professional receives money and therefore cannot possibly be sincere, because his livelihood depends on what a professional does, whereas an amateur does it for love. And uh, so many examples came from the 19th century of, say, 
someone like Heinrich Schliemann, who was an amateur archaeologist, and as much as he's cursed today by the professional archaeologists, he was very much at the forefront. And he poured his own personal wealth into his passion. Or another one, of course, is um, Arthur Evans, uh, who did the same with the island of Crete. I mean, the examples are very numerous. So for them, dilettantism was equal to creative freedom because as a dilettante, uh, as an amateur, one did not have to stick to certain rules that professionalism required. Um, they also called themselves uh, Nevsky Tikviste. In other words, uh, they loved uh, Dickens's uh, Tickwick papers. They really appreciated the humor, they appreciated the subtlety of them, and uh, Nevsky, well, Neva is the river, the Neva River in St. Petersburg, and then the Nevsky Prospect. Nevsky Prospect uh, is the Central Avenue, is the Fifth Avenue of uh, St. Petersburg, so that's what they called themselves. The primacy of beauty was their goal, and um, and for them was really the only basis for any art, which was the case for the um, aesthetic movement uh, in England as well. And so they were kind of uh, dreamily romantic, they very much appreciated um, irony, they, they, they loved the likes of Oscar Wilde or Aubrey Beardsley, that, that whole aesthetic movement. And the men themselves were just really absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of the greatest um, offshoots of uh, Miroskustva is um, the Valley Rus, right here. There's a documentary, sort of a documentary, that, that's narrated by Tilda Swinton, and it was done in 2013, so you can look it up. Uh, the Valley Rus existed for about 20 years, between 1909 and 1929. They were founded by Sergei Zagilev or Serge Zagilev, as he is known in the West. The film was made in conjunction with the exhibition Zagilev and the Valley Rus, right here. Sergei Zagilev came, again, from a fairly wealthy background, very cultured, very educated background, and um, he is the one who founded the Valley Rus, and during the 20 years of its existence, this ballet performed well in St. Petersburg, of course, in Moscow, but also in Paris, and, uh, and in Italy and in South America. And meanwhile, he persuaded, cajoled, and charmed the greatest talents of the early 20th century to join his company. And as a result, everybody, Picasso, Matisse, uh, among painters, composers, Stravinsky, Eric Satie, and then the choreographers, uh, uh, Michael Fokin and uh, uh, George Balanchin, dancers, Nijinsky, Anna Pavlova, Ida Rubinstein, and Alexandra Danilova. They were all part of the Belarus, and they all collaborated to realize uh, his dreams. And actually, this documentary is called When Art Danced with Music, which is true, because the art that was produced was unbelievable, was stunning. So was music, of course. And as I said, the ballet russe just revolutionized uh, the uh, art of ballet. They gave meaning to male dancers, in fact, because until that time, male dancers were just supports for ballerinas. Here, Zagilev, who loved men, he was a homosexual, and uh, <laughs> poor Nijinsky, in fact, because Nijinsky was his lover, but then Nijinsky turned around and married a lovely woman, uh, so Zagilev couldn't forgive him and uh, uh, kicked him out but um, Nijinsky did his own thing. But, uh, so he, Zagilev gave, uh, gave meaning to male dancers and gave a role to male dancers. Uh, one of the most brilliant artists who worked for the Baliahus was Leon Buxt. He was a member of the Zagilev uh, circle, uh, he, for which he designed exotic, richly colored sets and um, costumes. Here are some of his costumes in which, in, in his designs, in his sketches, he absolutely, brilliantly combined the intensity of color with, a, with an, an exquisite, an exquisite elegance of line. Just stunning, the line that could convey anything. When Leonardo once said that great art is when a significant emotion is conveyed by a convincing line, there's boxed right there. And here are his customs. Uh, this is this is the costume uh, of Cleopatra for Ida Rubinstein, and Ida once told the story how she went to Africa, and in Africa she herself uh, she killed a lion, 
and, uh, and of course Paris when she came back she uh, Paris was just listening to her open mouth mouth but one wit noticed that perhaps the only lion she really did kill was Leon Box who was always in love with her but here here are the customs for various ballets and uh, here's still another one and that was the production of Oscar Wilde's Salon and the Oscar Wilde Salon uh, the Aubrey Beardsley was a friend of Oscar Wilde and he did illustrations for Oscar Wilde which are extremely compelling and uh, this is the French version then he did the same thing uh, a different version in in England uh, but as I said it was kind of the same circle of people and here are more costumes and that's what I meant about the the intensity of color combined with this exquisite uh, imp impetuous line it's just brilliant uh, and here are his designs for Fèvre, for Racine's Fèvre, and here we see a Mycenaean Megaron, as Boxed had imagined it. He also, he was also passionately, just as Sirov was and all of them were, passionately interested in antiquity and particularly in uh, ancient Greece. And here he is painting this Terror Antiquis, and what he shows is uh, the disappearance of Atlantis. The, uh, the breaking up of the antique world. And in front of all this stands the figure of uh, an archaic quarry, uh, an archaic Greek figure in, uh, in full color, as if, uh, as if proving to whoever looks at this painting that the world nevertheless will survive and will live on and will be, uh, will be eternal. And there's almost um, an illusion of theatrical performance here as well which is intensified by the fact that we are removed from those ancient worlds by thousands of years and uh, the ancient world still lives with us and uh, the picture of the Cora is holding a bird as if a spirit that will fly away and survive. But Box was also a brilliant portraitist and here is his portrait of Sergei Diaghilev with his nanny and uh, here he is uh, in all his greatness and he, in all his confidence as well. And things were difficult. Uh, the Russian Revolution, they had to escape the Russian Revolution. And many of them came west. And uh, the majority of them came west, in fact. But they lost uh, a great deal of their fortune uh, in Russia in, with the Russian Revolution. And then the First World War uh, happened. All of this, of course, took its great toll on the company. And he was continuously struggling with uh, maintaining the company and yet was uh, was able to create an amazing phenomenon which influenced the in, the entire story of certainly of ballet but also of design in um, the 20th century a painting that box did which was uh, quite extraordinary and that was uh, in uh, 1902 um, which created as much uh, sensation in st petersburg and in moscow as, say, Sargent's uh, painting of um, Madame X, created in, um, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, for whatever reason, when he exhibited it in Russia, everybody was scandalized. This is not necessarily a portrait, even though the model was the wife of Alexander Benoit, who was another brilliant man in their, in their circle, and we'll talk about him presently. Um, but uh, Box did not aspire to exact portraiture. The subject is just conveying his love of, uh, of Art Nouveau and then also the idea of a femme fatale, uh, the enigmatic sort of very feline half smile, uh, also feline grace, shapely figure, she's tightly corseted in black and uh, well it was a scandalous success as it says here at the 5th World of Art exhibition in St. Petersburg in 1903. And uh, this was one of Buxt's uh, major triumphs as a virtuoso, stylist, and future legislator of um, uh, Parisian fashions. Now, speaking of Benoit, and she is the wife of Benoit, her name is Anne Benoit, and this is also reported by Buxt of uh, Benoit. Another man who came from an extremely uh, cultured uh, and distinguished family. And he truly had just universal interests. Uh, he had his degree in law, and uh, just as Vrubil had it, but he was uh, more interested in humanities. 
and uh, he was everything. He was, uh, he was a painter, he was an illustrator, he was a designer, he was a choreographer, he was uh, a writer, he was a memoirist, he was a historian, he was a traveler, he was everything. He was a universal mind. And uh, these are his sets for Stravinsky Petrushka. And uh, Benoit too was uh, fascinated with antiquity, but he was fascinated also with the Renaissance. He knew really old styles, and uh, in his designs for these various ballets and for various performances, he always managed to adopt uh, whatever he was illustrating or whatever performance he was designing for. He was he always managed to adopt it to a correct period and give uh, the those designs his own stamp. We saw one of his paintings. Uh, in Peter the Great contemplating the building of St. Petersburg. And it's sort of, as we looked at Serov's painting, Peter the Great striding through, uh, this is Benoit version. He actually did a whole series of, um, of Peter the Great. Uh, and in this case, he did illustrate Pushkin's uh, The Bronze Rider. That opened in 1782. It was commissioned by Catherine the Great. That became the symbol of St. Petersburg, still is. And then Pushkin wrote his great poem, the, the, the Bronze Rider or the Bronze Horseman. And um, it is about a great flood that happened in St. Petersburg in 1824. Yes, well, Pushkin was still alive. And um, it was really awful. And uh, it's about uh, a young man, he is poor, he is sitting in, uh, in his basement apartment dreaming about uh, a girl he loves and how he's going to do well in life and marry the girl, but then the flood comes and the flood destroys everything. And, uh, and then he thinks about the girl and he runs towards um, the place where the girl lived, and, but then find, finds everything destroyed and ruined and obviously the girl was... Uh, uh, the girl died, and so he goes mad, and and in his madness uh, he curses uh, he curses the uh, equestrian statue, and with his curse the statue comes alive, and begins to pursue the man as he runs. And here it is. Here's Benoit front to speech for his poem, and the statue pursues the uh, man as he runs away. Uh, the poem does not talk about the actual moment of death, but if I remember correctly, it does end with uh, his, uh, his body floating in the water. Uh, so, well, here, Benoit is illustrating that. Uh, and here's the bronze horseman, as done by Surikov, of whom we talked as well in the previous lecture, and it's in front of St. Isaac Cathedral which is, well, the largest Orthodox cathedral in Russia. Um, he, uh, not only he loved antiquity, but as I said, he loved uh, the uh, Dispitiem, he loved the Renaissance, uh, he loved various periods. He did a series of paintings on a number of these periods, and these are just the examples of a Marquis bathing. Uh, and he is clearly imagining someone like Pompadour bathing uh, in Versailles. And, um, uh, it's done in gouache on paper. Here they are, and there are a number of them. They're really charming. And even his style is very much Rococo. One thinks of Fragonard when one looks at these paintings by Benoit. He did uh, plenty of costumes, as you can imagine, and this is one, uh, one such costume for the opera Satko, uh, Rimsky, uh, Rimsky Korsakov's opera. Uh, Commedia dell'arte loved that as well, and his sketch love notes. Uh, by him, and this also looks like 18th century with those enormous wigs. But uh, one also begins to think, of course, of uh, of someone like Degas and uh, his portrayal of the stage and the orchestra. It all sort of falls together. It's a synthesis of human achievement, really, that Benoit lived by and lived in. That was his life. A uh, set designed for the Merchant of Venice, right here. And that is now more of a Renaissance uh, portrayal. And now we go to our last painter, and uh, he is Nikolai Rurik. And well, in Russian it's Rurik actually, but um, he is in that uh, group portrait. He is one of the founders of uh, Miroskustva, uh, or the world of art. He was a great traveler, as some other Russian artists that we had seen. He was, uh, as so often with these men in um, the world of art, in Miroskustva, he was just, he was a universal genius, really. 
painter, writer, archaeologist, philosopher, public figure, very interested in hypnosis and other spiritual practices. And uh, it is said that his paintings had a hypnotic expression. This is one of his paintings of Russia, of a town called Zvinigare. And, uh, well, he loved uh, the uh, symbolist tendency in art, uh, which, again, symbolist, fantasy, surrealism, these are all interchangeable notions. They all have to do with fantasy. They all have to deal with uh, some sort of symbolism. They all have to, to deal with dreams. There is a great museum in New York, actually, in the Upper West Side, I think, in uh, 100 and something Street. And this painting is in that museum in New York. Uh, done in, in tempera, uh, on wood, right here, and a Russian icon, that's where we began. And this is what he attempts to convey in the ancient ideals of Russia and ancient idea of Russia as we begin this course of lectures. Then off he goes to India, to Tibet, and here is his painting of the abode of King Gezar. And this has to do with an epic cycle that goes back presumably to the 12th century and has to do with the, with the mountains of Tibet, with the area of Tibet, and the legendary king who was a brilliant fighter, who was a great knight, who was fearless and extraordinary. And, uh, well, that's what uh, Rerik paints here. The colors are really extraordinary. Uh, still another, that's of Tibet, the Himalayas, and uh, a settlement in the mountains, uh, and uh, his whole idea of, uh, of conveying the spirit was uh, to try and reduce the extraordinary creation of nature to its, uh, uh, to its essentials. One thinks of cubism, but Mir Iskustva looked uh, very scantily on Russian avant-garde. They did not really accept the, the likes of uh, uh, Lisitsky, Malevich, even Kandinsky. Uh, that didn't interest them at all, and they did not think there was anything beautiful in it. And um, so, it has nothing to do with cubism. But the idea of reducing uh, the creation of nature to the essentials is very much there. Still another one, a star of a hero, it's sort of the same King Gizar from that same 12th century epic appears to be here, and it's dramatic. And here sits a philosopher, right there, just a silhouette. And against the, a lit-up structure in the back, and, uh, and watches the star falling down and contemplates on, uh, on the fate of mankind or on the divine creation. Just it's very compelling, very compelling art. Uh, and uh, I love this one. This is called Remember. And it is about a young warrior as he departs from his home. And all, all of this is done against, again, the mountains of Tibet. And as the young warrior leaves, the women of the household come out. And they are still busy with their household work because the two of them, perhaps a wife and a daughter, they have these pots on uh, their heads. And... Uh, He's supposed to just ride away, not to look back. All the goodbyes had already been said, but he can't because his heart is still in that home and his heart is still uh, with his family. And uh, he stops and he looks back and uh, there's just so much feeling in it, a uh, feeling of perhaps uh, I won't come back. Uh, I love you. I, I'm going into the unknown. I'm going into these mountains. Remember me, because I will always remember you. Just amazing, really. And uh, still another painting, and with this painting we'll conclude, because this is Rerik's painting of the guests from the overseas. In other words, the Varangians coming to Russia. And that's where we began our lectures with the Norsemen, the Varyagi, as they came to Kiev and established Kievan Rus, and here is uh, Rerik's um, illustration of that very Russian, extremely um, uh, colorful, perhaps a lot more colorful than, uh, than it was in reality, but uh, just full of hope and joy and, um, and the future, and beautiful future, as Miros Kustva um, imagined it to be. Uh, needless to say, they could not predict, uh, they could not foresee 
the horrors of the revolution. They could not foresee the horrors of uh, communism, of socialism. Um, thankfully, the majority of them, in fact, uh, were able to leave the country and to continue their brilliant work and, uh, and their brilliant pursuits in the West.